Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm just going to give us all a few minutes for all of our friends to join us here today. I'm at San Alejo State Beach in San Diego, California. And San Alejo State Beach is actually located in Encinitas, but it's within San Diego County, it's the northern part of the county. So we'll just have a few minutes to let our friends join us. And while we wait, let's observe the ocean behind me. What do you notice? I see some surfers. I see some coastal birds, the western gull. Lots of them flying around. I also notice some sea foam. And my guess is that this sea foam came from the recent algal blooms that we had here in Southern California. All right, and while we are waiting, if you don't mind grabbing a piece of paper and something to write with, because along the way today, I'm gonna to be asking you a few questions. And so you can write down your answers to check yourself. All right, friends, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Kristen, and I'm an, an interpreter here at this California State Park. Raise your hand if you've been to a California State Park before. Woohoo, lots of you. Awesome. So this is the California State Park. It's a state beach, again, located in San Diego County, northern San Diego County. I'm at San Alejo State Beach. All right, awesome. And so today's program is mainly geared towards ninth through 12th grade, but I hope that everyone can enjoy joining me here virtually at San Alejo State Beach. So first off, I wanna wish you happy MPA Monday. Woohoo! So yeah, today's Monday. Sometimes we don't like Mondays, but I personally love Mondays because Every Monday is MPA Monday. You might be thinking, Kristen, what is MPA Monday? Well, MPA stands for Marine Protected Area. And right behind me is a Marine Protected Area. The name of this Marine Protected Area right behind me is called Swamis. And so we have Marine Protected Areas in order to restore biodiversity, flourishing life. That's why we protect certain areas of the ocean. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So this program is gonna be about 45 minutes long. And like I mentioned before, if you want, you can grab a piece of paper and something to write with. As you notice, there's no chat feature, but there is a hand raising feature. So feel free to use that whenever I ask you questions because that's a great way that you and I can interact. If you have more in-depth questions to ask me, you can ask me on social media. So let me just share my screen with you. So if you have questions about today's program or if you wanna just take a picture, and share it with all of us. You can share it on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Ports Program or at CA State Parks SD for San Diego. So I'll leave this up for a moment if you want to take a picture of it and save it for later. All right, so I just told you that this is a MPA. Do you remember what that stands for? 
Awesome. So yeah, MPA stands for Marine Protected Area. So the word marine means ocean, protected. It's a place that we want to keep safe from harm. An area is a place. So it's a place in the ocean that we want to keep safe for all the species that live here. But part of my job here at California State Parks is to connect you to the ocean right behind me. So I want you to take a look. Notice any of the species here. Take a deep breath in. The ocean is quite amazing. Most of our planet is ocean, 71% of it. And I want you to ask yourself, how are you connected to the ocean? Are you connected to the ocean? Well, whether you live five miles away like I do, or 500 miles away from the ocean, you are connected to it. And you are connected by the water cycle and also through what's called a watershed. Raise your hand if you've heard that term watershed before. All right, we have some people that are familiar with watershed. So when I think of the word watershed, I think of a, a giant shed filled with water. Well, that's not exactly what it is. A watershed is a huge area of land and all the water included in that area that eventually drains into a larger body of water, like the ocean. And so watersheds are how all of us are connected to the ocean, even if we don't live right next to it. So I'm gonna share with you our local watershed here in Encinitas. Oh, and before I do that, here's a quick map of the United States. In the yellow circle, I have California. And in the red circle, I have San Diego, which is where I am located, so Southern California. And this is a map of our local watershed. Again, watersheds connect us to the ocean. So taking a look at this map, it seems that a water droplet pretty far away could end up in the ocean. So I'm gonna grab my pen here and let's fire up our imaginations for a moment, okay? Cool. So imagine you are a water droplet in a cloud and you plop down in front of your lawn. Let's say you live in Escondido and you plop down in your lawn. Where is that water droplet gonna go? Well, it might get evaporated, but if it doesn't, it's gonna make its way to a larger body of water, which is the Escondido Creek. But it won't stop there. It'll go through the Escondido Creek maybe picking up things along the way. Keep traveling down. And eventually it's, all this water is headed towards the ocean. But before this water reaches the ocean, it reaches the San Alejo Lagoon. Sorry, I'm not very good with my pen today. <laughs> so all this water reaches the San Alejo Lagoon. Hmm. Here is a picture of the San Alejo Lagoon, also known as an estuary. An estuary is a coastal wetland. So for those of you that might be local, raise your hand if you've ever been to an estuary before, or even the San Alejo Lagoon. Awesome. 
Awesome. I have a couple people raising their hands. Great. Estuaries are really fascinating places. One of my favorite types of ecosystems on earth. And so I hope you grabbed that piece of paper and something to write with, because I'm going to ask you a question that's going to make you use your observation skills. So are you ready? Taking a look at this picture, what are some similarities or differences that you notice between the estuary and the ocean? So some similarities or differences between the estuary at the top and the ocean at the bottom. And you can also list any other observations you have about this photo. You might be looking at that red circle in the corner. That's where I'm standing right now. And you can see that where I'm standing is proof that all of this water is connected. So I'll give you a moment to answer the question I asked you. What do you notice that's similar or different between the estuary and the ocean? And if you have someone sitting next to you, share your ideas with them. All right, I'm going to give you about 15 more seconds to write down any observations you might have. All right, so I'm gonna tell you what I noticed. And if I mentioned something that you wrote down, you can raise your hand. So one of the first things I noticed is that the water in the estuary looks a bit different than the water in the ocean. Awesome, some of you put that down. So does the estuary have fresh water or salt water in it? Hmm, well, let's think about this. So remember that map I showed you before of our watershed? All that water coming from the lakes and streams and rivers, that's all fresh water. And the water that comes in from the ocean, of course, is salt water. And they meet in the estuary. And when fresh water and salt water come together, that forms brackish water. So estuaries have brackish water, which is a mix of fresh water and salt water. Another observation I made was the color of the plants in the estuary look a little different than maybe the algae and the plants in the ocean. Did anyone put, put that down on their paper? All right. Awesome. Well, yeah, so estuaries have specialized plants that act as a natural filter, a giant natural filter, kind of like we might have a fish tank. And in a big fish tank, you might have a filter on the side. Estuaries do the same thing. They filter out some of the pollutants in the water before they reach the ocean. So that's why they're really important to protect. And speaking of protecting them, one thing that you might not notice from this picture is that both the ocean in the picture and the estuary are both marine protected areas, MPAs. All right, let's see what else I noticed about the estuary. Hmm. Well, I know there's a lot of species in the ocean, like fish. Do you think there are fish in the estuary as well?
All right. Awesome. So yes, there are fish in the estuary as well. Right where I'm standing, that's where the water connects. And sometimes fish will swim up through that outlet into the estuary to have their babies. And we call these fish boffs. Boffs, what does that stand for? Well, boff stands for big old female fertile fish. Hmm, that's a mouthful. So these female fish that are ready to have their babies swim up from the ocean and into the estuary. And they do that because the estuary has more protection from predators than the ocean. All right. The last thing I noticed in this photo is that there's a large neighborhood right next to the estuary in the ocean. Raise your hand if you noticed that was one of the observations that you made. There are houses right next to the ocean and the estuary. Awesome, great job. Yeah, so people love to live by the water. I sure do. But there might be some impacts going on by having all of those houses right next to this water. Do you think pollution gets into the water? It can make its way into the water. I have a little demonstration set up to show you. So I'm gonna move my camera. Oh. And I want you to be thinking about what types of pollution we might find in the water. Move this down. All right. I hope everyone can see this. It might be hard to see me, but it's more important that you see this demonstration table. So here, I have two jars. This jar represents all of our fresh water, our water in our watershed. So all the water from the lakes and streams and rivers, all the water that's flowing through the lawns of, the, of that neighborhood, those houses. And this jar represents the ocean. So I have this on top, this sort of filter looking thing. What do you think this represents? This represents the estuary, because remember I said estuaries are giant natural filters. So I put a filter on top of this one, because all this water will go through the estuary before reaching the ocean. But as we observed, there, were, there are houses near the water. And so there are a lot of human interactions going on. One I can think of is trash. So we might have trash that gets into our watershed. So I'm gonna add some trash there. Can you think of ways that trash would get into our watershed? Maybe on a windy day like this, there might be some trash that blows out of the trash can. All right, what other types of pollution might we find? Here I have hazardous waste. Hmm, raise your hand if you know what hazardous waste is, or if you could think of an example of hazardous waste. Right, so one example I can think of is electronics. Hazardous waste is something that when it breaks down, it produces toxic chemicals, chemicals that are toxic to plants and animals and even humans. And so I'm gonna add that to our watershed. Unfortunately, we do have hazardous waste sometimes, and that can be from household chemicals or, like I said, electronics. But luckily, there is a way to prevent that. There are places that you can recycle your electronics. So instead of just throwing away your old phone, you can recycle it. 
All right. Next, I have oil. Where might oil come from in that neighborhood? How would oil get into our water? Cars, right? We have so many cars. And say if one of them is leaking and it leaks onto the, onto the street and then it rains, that rain will carry the oil down towards the ocean. What about pet waste? Do you think pet waste is a type of pollution? Because it is natural, right? Well, pet waste is a type of pollution, even though it's organic. Pet waste can make chemical changes to our watershed and increase algal blooms and de decrease the clarity of water. And so if you have a pet at home, make sure you pick up your pet waste. All right, so we just went through some interactions that we might find in that neighborhood. And this is how our water is looking. It's not looking too good. Let's see what happens as this water travels down and enters the ocean. What do you observe? All right, let's take a look. Let's see what happened. So the estuary on top did catch some of that trash and also some of that pet waste. Because like I said, estuaries can filter natural pollutants like pet waste. And also some of the trash will get stuck in the estuary. That doesn't mean it completely goes away. We'd still have to go to the estuary to pick it up but it's a lot easier to pick up trash in an estuary than before it reaches the, than if it reached the ocean. But taking a look at our water, estuaries aren't perfect at filtering everything. And some of our pollution, some of our hazardous waste and oil still reach the ocean. So if I was a fish, I wouldn't want to live in here, would you? No, probably not. Well, it doesn't have to be like that. Because all of those things that we just went through, the trash, the hazardous waste, the oil, those are all from human interactions. And that means that we can change that, right? So right now with your pencil and something to write with, or with your piece of paper and your pencil, I would love for you to think of some ways that we can prevent pollution from entering our watershed. It can be the pollution we talked about today or other types. But I know that there is something that we can all do in our own neighborhood to prevent that from happening. So if you're sitting next to somebody Share your ideas with them. What can you do to prevent pollution from entering the ocean? And please share your ideas, save your ideas, and share them on social media. I would love to hear them because there are things you can do right at home. You don't even have to leave your house to make a difference in the ocean. I'll let you take a moment to really think about those while I put away my umbrella because it's just getting a little too windy out here. So we'll regroup in about one minute.
All right, I hope you guys came up with some great ideas on how we can prevent pollution from entering our watershed and our ocean. You might be thinking, hmm, Kristen, you said that behind you is a marine protected area. So isn't it protected from pollution? Nope, it's not protected from pollution. So that's why it's still important for us to do our part. But this area behind me is protected from some other things. But why is it protected, you might be wondering. Well, marine protected areas are put in place due to different habitats that are there. I'm gonna find a, a sample of a certain habitat that is here. That I found along the beach. It's kind of dried out now, but usually it's bright, bright green. And this is called surf grass. This is a plant that you find here. And underneath the water here, we have large surf grass beds. And so this plant is one of the reasons that this area, Swami's MPA, was chosen to be a protected area. Can you think of any species that might benefit from this being protected from the surf grass? Hmm. Well, I'll share with you one of my favorite animals that we have. The green sea turtle. This is one of the species that benefits from surf grass. As you notice, the green sea turtle is just hanging out in the surf grass bed. It's a food source but it's also a habitat or a home. So it's extremely important. This surf grass also provides one other function. It's something to eat, something to live in, but also it provides protection. Yeah, species will use surf grass beds to hide from their pre predators. So this is just one of the habitats here, the main habitat here, but there are other habitats as well, such as rocky reefs and sandy bottoms, and also a small kelp forest. Whoa, kelp forest, one of my favorite places. So just like we have forests on land, there are forests in the ocean made up of tall, long stalks of giant kelp. I couldn't find any here on the beach today, but I did bring a model. I have a model here of the giant kelp, which is the most common kelp you'll see along the coast of California. And species will use this kelp forest similarly to the surf grass beds. They'll use the kelp for food, for a home or habitat, but also for protection. Those female fish, those boffs, sometimes they'll lay their eggs in the kelp forest and they'll come down and their eggs will be more protected. But we are actually slowly seeing a decline in, in kelp. And for two main reasons. One is due to climate change. Climate change causes the, the water to warm up and this giant kelp likes cooler waters. But we're also seeing a decline in kelp because of over harvesting. Hmm, why would we wanna harvest kelp? Well, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. I want you to raise your hand if you brushed your teeth this morning. Oh, we got one person. Oh, okay, now we have more. 
Yay. <laughs> well, if you did brush your teeth this morning, hopefully you did, you might have used kelp. Yeah, kelp is actually in a lot of different items that we use every day, like toothpaste and cheese, lotion, chocolate milk. And so historically, kelp has been over harvested, which means too much of it is taken out of the ocean. And that's where marine, marine protected areas come in. Right here at Swami's MPA, it is not allowed to harvest or take any type of kelp. So it is protected from being over harvesting here in the MPA. So we just talked about some of the habitats that are here, but these habitats aren't empty, right? There are species that benefit from these habitats. And because this 12 square mile marine protected area is a spatial marine protected area, that means everything inside is protected. So let's take a look at some of the species that live here. Here I have a map of Swami's Marine Protected Area. You can see in that dark blue, that's that 12 square miles. You can also see the San Alejo Lagoon, which is another MPA. It's a different type. It's a no-take, meaning you can't take anything from there at all. And so looking at Swami's Marine Protected Area, there are species that live in there all the time and who just come by for a visit. So we say that there are some that directly benefit from it being protected. They directly benefit from all these habitats being protected. And some species benefit, but they benefit indirectly, meaning they don't live here all the time, but they might stop by and grab something to eat in the kelp forest. So they're still benefiting from this marine protected area, but they benefit indirectly. So now with your piece of paper, next I'm going to show you some of the different species that live here that either uh, benefit directly or indirectly. So you can write them down and you can guess if you think that they directly benefit or indirectly benefit from our marine protected area. So I hope we're all ready. The first one is the scorpion fish. So you can write it down, but also show me, raise your hand if you think the scorpion fish directly benefits. All right, I have a few of you raising your hand. Awesome. So the scorpion fish does benefit. And I noticed that because I'm looking to see how he blends in with this environment. That's that sandy bottom habitat. And he's camouflaged, he blends in. So he probably spends a lot of time in that habitat. So yes, the scorpion fish directly benefits from this MPA. Next, we have the blue mussel. These mussels are holding on to that rocky reef for dear life. Do you think that they're here all the time? Do they directly benefit or indirectly benefit? Raise your hand if you think they directly benefit. Awesome. My friends, you guys are doing great. They directly benefit. Ooh, what about the leopard shark? This is one of my favorite species here at Swami's MPA. Hmm, do they live here all the time? Well, I'll give you a hint with this next photo. I have a leopard shark migration. That word migration means to move around, right? So these leopard sharks migrate all along the coast of California. And so they're not in the MPA all the time, but they do benefit. They benefit indirectly. And you can notice that surfer in the, in the picture. 
sometimes sharks make us nervous, but there's no need to be nervous around the leopard shark. They are pretty docile. All right, you guys are doing great. Next one is the harbor seal. So cute. Do you think the harbor seal directly benefits from this being a marine protected area or indirectly? Mm. Well, the harbor seal benefits indirectly. So if you put indirectly, you are correct. The harbor seal will travel pretty far to find food. And sometimes they'll even leave their pups at the beach while they go look for food. And that's why it's very important when we see wildlife like the harbor seal to maintain our distance, to observe them from afar. Because in this scenario, if we got too close to those harbor seal pups, we might scare them away. And then the mom will come back with the food and their pups won't be there. So it's important to appreciate wildlife from a distance. All right, our last species today is the Western Snowy Clover. Hmm. Sometimes we think about the things that live in the ocean and we forget to think about some of the species that benefit but don't necessarily live in the water. So do you think the snowy plover directly benefits or indirectly benefits from this area being protected? Raise your hand if you put indirect. Awesome. That's right. So the snowy plover indirectly benefits, but they still benefit quite greatly. So if you can put your hands just like this, the snowy plover could fit in the palm of your hand. And this bird is near endangered. But here, this area being protected helps the snowy plover. Hmm, how? Raise your hand if you've ever collected sea seashells at the beach before. I know I have. It's a fun thing to do. Right, and that's okay at some places, but here in an MPA, here at Swami's, the seashells are even protected. Now, why would we protect the seashells? Hmm. Well, that snowy plover I showed you will use items like seashells to line their nest in the sand dunes. So everything is connected. And even leaving small items like seashells helps species like the snowy plover. Woo! So we've talked about the habitats here and some of the species that live here. And I've talked about some of the reasons why we protect this area because of the snowy plover. Do you think of any other reason why we would want to protect this piece of the ocean? Why would we want to protect 12 square miles of the ocean? Hmm. You can write down your idea or share it with someone next to you. Why would we want to protect the ocean? Well, I don't know about you, but I love spending time at the ocean. And so one of the reasons we want to protect it is for people, right? For people to be able to enjoy. And there are a lot of fun things you can do here at Swami's MPA when we are fully open. You can surf here. You can bird watch, you can visit the tide pools and carefully step around. You can also spearfish here. 
which is on my personal bucket list. Let me share with you a picture of this because it is amazing. So spear fishing, notice what she is swimming through. That's the kelp forest I was talking about earlier. As you can see, the kelp gets much larger than that model that I have. And so spearfishing is allowed here. You can take certain types of fish in certain amounts. The main thing that is not allowed here in Swami's MPA that really helps protect the ecosystem is commercial fishing. Commercial fishing is not allowed here. And raise your hand if you know what commercial fishing is. Yeah, so by looking at this photo, you can see that commercial fishing is taking large amounts of fish out of the ocean all at one time. Usually this fish is sold for profit in restaurants and grocery stores. And while this might be necessary in some places because I do like to eat fish sometimes, it is not allowed in the MPA. And the reason it's not allowed in the MPA is because when we take too much from one area too often, it doesn't allow the fish to replenish. So because there's no commercial fishing in the MPA behind me, we have an abundance of fish. And this abundance of fish spills over into the surrounding waters. Hmm, that might be kind of hard to picture. So I want you to imagine a big bucket of popcorn. And it's popping and it's getting more and more full. Imagine those are the fish and they get older and they have babies and that generation grows up and then has more offspring. Eventually this area is getting pretty full. So in our popcorn bowl, popcorn's gonna start spilling over on the sides. Well, that's what happens out here with those boffs, those big old fertile female fish. Because this area is protected, but there's no actual boundaries in the water. So they have a place to thrive and they can swim out into the surrounding waters. So by protecting relatively small area of the ocean, it improves the entire coastal ecosystem. Pretty neat. Now we've talked about two different MPAs today. We talked about the San Alejo Lagoon, which is an estuary. And we talked about Swami's MPA, which is right behind me. Do you think that there are more than just two MPAs? How many MPAs are there? I don't know. Let's find out. So here I have a map of California. And every single dot you see on that map is a marine protected area. And they are different colors because there are different types of marine protected areas. Swami's is a partial take, meaning you can take some fish, like I mentioned earlier, with spear fishing and shore fishing. The San Alejo Lagoon is a no take, meaning you can't take anything at all. And there are even some marine protected areas that don't allow people to visit because the ecosystem is so fragile. There are, there are lots of different types of MP, MPAs and there are 124 just along the coast of California. And I'd like you to take a look at this map and use your imagination. Because earlier I was talking about 
the spillover of fish, right? This, we call that the spillover effect. And I use popcorn as an example. And so this is happening at each one of those dots that you see on that map. So by having these places along the coast that are protected, it creates a network, a connected network that improves the biodiversity of our coastal ecosystem. It's pretty cool, huh? We've learned a lot today. Let's just take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Woohoo! MPAs are pretty cool. But remember, even if you live far away from the ocean, you are still connected. And I would love for you to dive in deeper to see how you are connected to the ocean. Let me share my screen again. can draw your own watershed. So earlier I showed you my watershed here in Encinitas and how water travels down to reach the ocean. So what you can do is you can use Google Maps. You can find your house, find the nearest body of water and try to map out the journey that water takes from your house to the largest body of water. And this might not be directly towards the ocean, but eventually all water will end up interacting with the ocean. And once you do that, I challenge you to identify three problems or sources of pollution that could impact your watershed and come up with solutions. So earlier when we looked at that photo of the estuary and we looked at that neighborhood, we came up with some ways that we can prevent pollution from entering our watershed. One of the examples I came up with, oops, was to cycle your electronics. There are some other things I can come up with too. There are, especially there are three words that all start with an R. Can you guess what I'm talking about? They are reduce, reuse, and recycle. Those are three things that we can do in our own neighborhood to prevent pollution from entering our watershed. So if you do draw out the journey of a water droplet from your house, or from a local park to the ocean, or if you have ideas about how to reduce pollution in our watershed, share it with us on social media. You can also do research on your local marine protected area. Because marine protected areas are pretty cool and they do protect a lot of the species and plants here, but the ocean still needs our help. So I'm gonna share with you one more time how you can submit any MPA art or any of your ideas about reducing pollution. And if you do share any of your art, because you can be creative with your journey as a water droplet to the ocean. You, you can um, hashtag ports fan art and also MPA Monday. And be sure to visit some of the other California state parks at ports-ca.us. So again, I want to thank you all for joining me here at San Alejo State Beach. I am very thankful that I was able to virtually connect you to one of my favorite places. And I, encourage you to continue to 
think about how you are connected to the ocean. We'll just take a moment to enjoy this view. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.